you're the CEO of the ADHD Foundation. You know, you've been there since since its inception, as far as I understand, in 2007, I think it is. Um, Mm -hmm. You've led the organization for over a decade. You've been involved in in advocating and leading interventions and campaigns around initiating change on behalf of those who experience some of the challenges around ADHD. You've got an extensive background in this. And so um, I was really keen, I guess, to try and understand because you have your background as well, actually, also as a child and adolescent psychotherapist. And so I really wanted to ask, well, where, first of all, where did this, this journey into what you've been doing begin for you? Um, where did this sense of, of mission to help in the ways that you have been helping first come from? Um, well, I think if I'm being really honest, Mika, it was in my own childhood, um, I really struggled with ADHD, but I didn't know then that I had ADHD because, um, when I went to school in the seventies, um, I certainly didn't fit that stereotype of, you know, this naughty fidgety boy. Um, and then I was about 29 years of age. I was doing a job in Canada I uh, met some people with ADHD and that's really kind of when the penny dropped. And that was about 1992, but you couldn't get a diagnosis as an adult then. Um, so I just devoured everything that came out of Stanford and Harvard around positive psychology, positive psychiatry. Um, and um, went back to university, had a change of career, became a mental health specialist, um, did a psychology doctorate. Uh, but the doctorate was in ADHD because a lot of the young people who I was working with um, had a diagnosis of ADHD, but my experience of them was very different to the information that was passed on as a referral. So some of it is lived experience, Mika, but I think also um, because I don't I don't talk particularly um, about my own experience. I think my job um, as a chief exec of, of, of a user-led service like the ADHD Foundation Neurodiversity Charity is to um, advocate for and represent the ADHD population, which is one in 20 people um, who I think have been very misunderstood, stigmatised, experienced a lot of exclusion, um, some of it overt, some of it subtle, Uh, particularly within an educational context, um, but also in terms of access to health services. Uh, And it was just something really that, uh, it was a passion. I don't know where it came from. It was never on my bucket list to be a CEO. Um, It just kind of evolved. And I think really, you know, I've accepted um, that there was a job to be done. And I'm one of a a, a really incredible team. The whole neurodiversity agenda, Mika, is, is a really important point to make because I think, Certainly, in recent years, we've begun to recognise that if one in 10 people have dyslexia, if one in 20 people have ADHD, if one in 60 people have autism, if one in 20 people have dyspraxia, if one in 20 have dyscalculia, you think, well, that's roughly about 20% of humankind who have a different neurocognitive capability that sort of sits outside of the standard distribution curve. And just because they're on the edges of a standard distribution curve doesn't make them abnormal, disordered, disabled. Um, Rather, it just means they think differently. But in a neurodiverse paradigm, what we're saying is if 20% of humankind have brains that work in a slightly different way, then there has to be an evolutionary reason as to why. Um, I think the world would be a much duller place without people who had dyslexia, and ADHD. And of course, all the research that's coming out now is, is really sort of testament to that. We know that over 30% of business owners have ADHD or dyslexia, for example. Yeah. Um, we know that 40% of millionaires have dyslexia. We know there are lots of very famous people in all kinds of different professions who have dyslexia, ADHD, autism, etc. So I think um, it is about moving away from that I think, very narrow 19th century concept of what we mean by intelligence, how we measure intelligence and ability. Um, And while we don't tie left-handed children's hands to the chair anymore, the metaphor still holds true in some respects in terms of how we educate children and how we measure people's ability. And I think there's a a really exciting change of conversation happening. And it's just a very, it's a privilege to be a part of it. 
when you were talking there, I sort of think to myself, I've become increasingly persuaded or convinced that pe perhaps people like Nikola Tesla, Thomas Edison, people of this ilk, I don't know what you think about this, possibly or probably had um, ADHD. But one of the things that you highlight there as well, also about, I guess, and I've heard you speak about this before as well, I guess the day-to-day -day experience of ADHD and there being such a, a mental health aspect to it as well, which for, mm. for whatever reason, something I never really considered when really trying to think through the ADHD experience. And I was wondering, I wanted to ask you, what's your perspective on what you feel tends to be the most misunderstood aspects of the ADHD experience, whether on a societal level or by mm. businesses in the workplace? Well, I think it, it's a fascinating question and it's a very rich question in many respects, Mika, because when you and I went to school, that culture, that we were all enculturated into that if a child had ADHD, it meant they were badly behaved and that they were given a pill to make them behave mm -hmm. as, as if there was such a thing as a morality pill, um, which is all complete nonsense, of course. Being forgetful and fidgeting is not bad behavior. That's just the body's natural way of trying to balance your neurochemistry because when you move, you produce more of a neurotransmitter mm -hmm. called dopamine which helps you concentrate. So sitting still is actually counterintuitive to cognitive functioning. Um, but I think for many people, the fact that you, you know, the term, you know, it's a Ferrari brain with, with bicycle brakes, you can be hyperactive, you can have a hyperactive mind, it can be exhausting sometimes, but it's also a real source of creativity and energy and, and drive. So I think for me, it's about context and how you manage ADHD. But I think one of the things that most people come back to me with is that I think probably the thing they find the most challenging is sometimes this low level pervasive kind of anxiety that's just always there, that you never quite feel um, as relaxed and settled because your mind works at such a speed. Um, and I think for many people, again, you know, um, you choose lifestyles that suit your particular um, cognitive profile and interests. And the other thing to remember is ADHD is, is a small part of who you are. It doesn't define you. It's not your character. It's not your personality. It's just that your brain works slightly differently. And um, for many people, it really travels alone. So 40% of people with ADHD, I mentioned, also have dyslexia. But there are nearly 30% of people with ADHD that also have autism and sometimes there is this overlap with dyscalculia and things um but i think that's part of the rich diversity of human neurocognitive capacity and i think there's a like i said there's an evolutionary reason for it um yes some things can be a struggle being forgetful can be a struggle um but i also think now with assistive technology um and sort of different strategies that we all learn to help us you know, um, work at our best, that managing ADHD successfully is something that most people can do with the right help and support, particularly, I think, if you get that support early in childhood. Um, it reminds me of, um, there's that Albert Einstein quote, I'm probably going to butcher it now, to be honest with you, but I think he says something along the lines of, um, everybody's born a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll grow up thinking that it's stupid. The analogy is great, but it wasn't Einstein. Um, but, but the analogy is absolutely true, isn't it? There isn't a single human being on this earth, Mika, that looks like you, that sounds like you. There are 8 billion people. And what that tells us is that the universal design is the difference is good. And I think historically, because of our social kind of... Um, as a social species, we, we need to bond and attach to other human beings. We thrive in relationship. The genetic imperative is relationship driven. And we like to be around people of like mind who like the things that we do, who think the way that we do. Um, in some communities, look the way that we do, sound the way that we do. And actually, that isn't the universal design, is it? We were born a, a, a planet of many races. Um, and cultures and different types of talents and abilities um and we're a remarkably adaptable species but we we are a social species as well and having a sense of belonging is really important but here's the thing 
you can be different and still belong because that is the universal design. We do not all have to be the same. I guess as an organisation, you have a unique perspective on, I guess, the, co the current social perception as it pertains to how organisations are perhaps learning to think about ADHD, whether it's in education, um, health services, employment, politics. Um, how do you feel like the perspective on ADHD or, or perhaps neurodiversity more broadly, how do you feel like it's evolved over the last five to 10 years, are things changing? Yes, most definitely. Um, I think there's far greater understanding, far greater awareness, much less stigma. There is now a wave of adults who are getting an assessment and a diagnosis for ADHD in adulthood, who have always had ADHD, but because they didn't identify with that stereotype that stigmatized stereotype about you know naughty fidgety boys um mm -hmm. and and i think the fact that we're seeing so many adults now um go for an assessment is is i think indicative of the fact that we're moving away from that sort of shame and stigma i think the d words like deficit and disorder don't help i think that needs to change um i don't know that it is a disorder i'm not sure that i would identify as being disabled either i know that some people do if you'd have asked me is adhd a disability when i was 14 years of age then yes in that context it most certainly was and it's not that i'm anti-medical model and just pro-social sort of theory model of disability i think the the truth lies somewhere in the middle i think um you know uh, I still take medication for ADHD. Um, it's one of a whole range of strategies that I use to manage it. I'm not embarrassed or ashamed or stigmatized by it. I think probably as a child or as a young man, I would have been. But I think public perceptions have moved on. I think young people, particularly when I look at young people and the generation of young people coming through now, you know, they don't see colour, sexuality. They, they're much more accepting. You know, we know that exclusion, that racism, that homophobia is, is something that is taught and learned in the same way that we were all taught as children that the children who were classed as special needs were the ones that were seen as the bottom of the heap in school, uh, the ones that weren't very intelligent, the ones that were the most bullied on the playground, um, which is hideous, isn't it? You just think, why is being different seen as, as, as something less than? Why are people who were different othered by a majority? Um, why is this, you know, this need where you've got to be like us, you've got to think like us. And of course, the really interesting thing in industry maker is that, you know, we see a lot of industries now who are actively recruiting neurodiverse people, whether it's ADHD, autism, dyslexia, um, GCHQ and the security services, MI5 and MI6 in the UK are kind of the most recent to kind of announce that they recognize that people with those kind of minds excel at certain tasks. Um, and, you know, for many industries now, if you think about the employment market, it's a very different world to what it was even 20 years ago. Um, the world is changing rapidly. The kind of competencies that we value in a workplace, in an economy, are different from what they were even 20 years ago. Um, and I think the pace of change has been challenging for young people. But I think what it has done is it's really brought out that if you are going to have any organisation that's successful, you have to understand that whether people have got a diagnosis or not, 20% of your workforce is neurodiverse and 20% of your customers are. And if you need different solutions to new opportunities and new challenges, then the people around the decision-making table of necessity must be able to look at these opportunities and challenges from a different perspective and through a different lens because we don't live in a neurotypical world. Are there things that employers can do in terms of like creating a more inclusive environment that really harnesses or allows some of the talents of those who have ADHD or other types of neurodiversity to have a better opportunity to really flourish? Yeah, and actually there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening in industry. Um, in, interestingly, industry is way ahead of the curve than our educational paradigm. Um, uh, um, and even within our health paradigm, you know, a neurodiversity uh, 
paradigm, I think, doesn't sit comfortably with medical taxonomy and, and a medical model that is a disease-based, deficit-based lens rather than embracing difference, you know. Um, just because something isn't common doesn't mean it's abnormal. I think, you know, language and the evolution of language is really important, isn't it, when it comes to excluded communities and minority communities. But in many industries now, we're seeing people in, you know, executive roles in banks who have ADHD. Um, in industries, perhaps, where people didn't necessarily speak out publicly about being neurodiverse. And I use the term neurodiverse rather than neurodivergent because um, I think if neurodiversity is the norm and neurodivergence is diverging from the norm, then there's a contradiction in terms. And, and, and those two words, again, have their origins in a medical model that are about, well, one is normal and one is not normal. And actually what we're saying is that difference is is the norm, is the universal design. And I don't refer to people of color as being racially divergent. I don't refer, refer to LGBT, LGBT people as, as sexually divergent. So I don't identify as neurodivergent. And I think there are many people out there with ADHD who are being really successful, who by demonstrating their enormous talents and commitment and character and all these other things that they bring to any organization or business is, you know, they're breaking down those those stigmatizing barriers and people are recognizing that ADHD doesn't define you. It's it's an element of somebody which, along with their character and their life experience and all kinds of other things, um, makes them, you know, who they are. So any good HR manager knows that that kind of diversity in the workforce Um and I mean diversity in the broader sense, is always going to be good for business. It's good for culture. Um, it's vibrant. It gives us many, many different perspectives um, that really enriched our common humanity. Hmm. Drink. I really love that. Um, I want to ask you lastly, because I am mindful of time as well, just kind of on that, I guess, looking towards the future, I guess, uh, in a sense, because both yourself and the ADHD Foundation have been involved in creating massive change in this space you know you've been campaigning in national forums you've been involved in authoring or designing um policy um, around public services to be more in accommodating or more inclusive like what's still on the horizon for you what do you get um excited about helping us move toward where do you imagine what that future for those with adhd um, or neurodiversity, neurodiversity in general might look like i think when we get to a point where we recognize that human intelligence, the diversity of human neurocognitive capabilities, um, our understanding of um, diversity as the universal design. Um, mm -hmm. I think at so many levels, um, that's a very powerful paradigm um, that's influencing the world because Again, it is about acceptance. It is about embracing difference. It's about celebrating difference. I think the sum is greater than the parts is what I'm trying to say, Mika. If we're all different and we're all designed differently and we all have a mind that is as unique as our fingerprint, um, then to me, the evolutionary purpose behind that is the sum must be greater than the parts. And I think our 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 mission in life has got to be around understanding um, what that sum is in terms of um, how we make this world a more inclusive uh, place for everybody to be able to achieve their potential and contribute to their communities and feel that they belong. Um, and I think the fact that these conversations are happening now more and more is a good thing. I'm impatient for the changes in policy. Uh, we need that to move on much more quickly. Um, but I think it's about the evolving conversation. And I think it's about saying to everybody who your organization works with, you know, is that policy changes aren't made by politicians. Policy changes are made by communities who say to their elected representatives, this is the kind of nation I want to live in. This is the kind of, you know, uh, work environment I want to live in. This is the kind of world I want to live in. I want one where, you know, 
the, the, the best of who we all are has the opportunity um, to evolve and make that contribution because I think we're all the richer for it. If that sounds a bit utopian and a bit idealistic, I'm very sorry, but I do think that the policy change is, is something that uh, is coming, but I think people do need to be honest and I'd like more people in leadership roles to start speaking publicly and without any shame or embarrassment about the fact that they might have dyscalculia or dyslexia. And for want of a better word, we need to normalize difference. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that is beautifully and powerfully put, Tony. Thank you very much. Um, how can people get in contact or how can people keep abreast of what you guys are doing in the ADHD Foundation? Um, well, we I think we have about a quarter of a million social media followers on a number of different platforms. Um, which is probably the best way to find out what we're doing on a regular basis. The, the, there's a, a website which is currently being reconfigured um, that has a vast amount of resources for professionals in education, health, social care, justice, business. We're doing a lot more work with, with, with businesses now. Um, and um, that's the main source of, of, of information. Um, if anybody does have a specific question, there's a there's an email info at. Um, I would discourage people from from using the telephone because the phone is ringing off the hook, as you can imagine. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have the capacity to make up for what the NHS cannot do. Um, but we are working really hard with government organizations to try and make sure that public services particularly are more inclusive and more accessible um, to neurodiverse people. Um, and, and again, interestingly, as I said, uh, we're knocking at an open door with businesses. And I think for everybody, it's about seeing your community through, through a lens of neurodiversity. But, you know, there's lots of information on the website. There's lots of information on social media that you can keep up with what we're doing. But remember, we're just one of many organizations and individuals who are part of this fascinating conversation and, and emerging new paradigm. And it's, it is exciting and it is a privilege to be a part of it. And for a man of my age, I'm absolutely delighted and a little bit relieved that I'm seeing it happen in my lifetime. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Uh, let me know in the comments. And as ever, subscribe, like the video, hit the notification bell so that you don't miss out on future content. And I will see you soon.